You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Archaeo Animals, Episode 60. Ancient Crafts and Ghost Stuff. Experimental Zoo Archaeology. I'm your host, Alex Fitzpatrick, and with me as always... Simona Falanca. And yeah, I mean, it's basically what the title says. We are going to talk about experimental zoo archaeology and... More importantly, it's another case study heavy episode, folks. So all in all, great up already. (laughs) Yep. Every segment is third segment. Just as God intended, truly. (laughs) But experimental zooarchaeology, or even experimental archaeology in general, I feel like something we've kind of touched upon every so often in episodes. most likely, because I mean, a lot of uh, well, the case studies in particular are sort of mm. um, sometimes focus on how certain hypotheses have been proven through experimental means. So, yeah, we've definitely kind of touched upon it a bit, but just as a bit of a quick kind of debrief on what we are talking about, in case you're a new listener and this is your first one, in which case, hello and sorry for starting you off like this. But experimental archaeology in general is basically contemporary experiments that try to replicate or recreate either activities or objects or, you know, even events in some cases from the archaeological record to better understand how, for example, what objects, how they were used or however they ended up the way they do when we find them, when we actually excavate them. So some examples can include, you know, recreating tools and weapons, which is probably the most common form of experimental archaeology, like uh, flint napping and things like that. Trying certain methods of cooking or crafting, which we'll obviously get into a bit more later on in this episode, or even recreating structures or replicating rites, which is, I think, particularly popular, at least recreating structures here in the UK. Oh, no, absolutely. I think you can think of a few places that you can visit in Britain yeah. where you can see sort of replicas of archaeological structures. I guess more specific to zoo archaeology, however, so it's well, pretty much the same thing, except that course animal bones are involved so it specifically looks at how to replicate or recreate the exploitation of animals in the past so that way you gain an understanding of how sort of your zooarchaeological assemblage has come into being that could be you know like both in the way the animals were kept and exploited but also what the animals may have looked like in the past yes so there's especially with zooarchaeology where we're dealing with once living creatures, loads of elements in place when it comes to how they were used, how they died, how they decomposed and were impacted by taphonomy. So there's loads of reasons why we should be doing experimental zoo archaeology. And also it's very interesting and cool. So And fun. Yeah. yeah, and it's fun, depending on what you do. It's pretty fun, if not a bit gross and smelly, because archaeology anyway so let's look at uh, animal use to start off with and perhaps one pretty easy first kind of example of experimental zoo archaeology is hunting obviously like one of our first relationships perhaps between human and animal species is that of prey predator maybe not the first but one of the earlier ones i guess yeah, look at that fluffy animal. I'm going to eat that. Yeah, big food. So the first case study that we have in this, again, all case study episode, is shark teeth used as weapons. So now shark teeth, commonly found in archaeological contexts, well, not so much in Britain, but around the world, are often interpreted as natural remains or used as ornaments. But tools, it's not necessarily the first sort of thing that comes to mind. Now, like various shark species remains from Rio do Meio, Brazil, have been analysed. So the methods include sort of use wear analysis, where experimental replicas are compared to archaeological artefacts. Now, the tool designs were replicated based on both ethnographic and archaeological data. Thus, like they were able to create recreate various tools such as knives piercers and arrowheads which were then tested and that's the gross bit on (laughs) animals such as pigs fish and deer 
And with the results, a database was created for further use, which could then be implemented to understand how to best identify various uses of shark teeth in the archaeological context, essentially by comparing the marks that the shark teeth would leave on the remains of these species. I apologize, that's a my coffee machine turning itself off. <laughs> no sharks were harmed in, <laughs> in the making of that coffee. And it's still going. But yeah, I mean, it's a good example of kind of one of the reasons why you'd want to do experimental archaeology or zooarchaeology, which is, you know, one of the things about archaeology is it's not nice and neat in any sense of the way we use that phrase. So, you know, you never really have a perfect or good sample set to kind of compare things with. So one great thing is to kind of try and replicate uh, objects or artifacts or whatever, and, you know, be able to see how it impacts other objects, like in this case, you know, stabbing and different kinds of animal flesh, and being able to kind of see how we can use that data to compare it to archaeological samples. Um, speaking of, we're going to continue with the, the fishy type of theme, unfortunately, I guess, for me. <laughs> we're talking about bone gorges. So a bone gorge is a type of hook that it's not really a hook, though. It, it's like a long cylinder of bone, and then both ends are sharpened. So these are found in sites on the Western Cape coast of South Africa, but are not entirely confirmed to be for fishing, despite what you may think. And some other theories are they might have been used to catch birds or even to pry shellfish from rocks. So archaeologists have done experiments where they've recreated bone gorges using uh, impala. Epicheros melampus. melampus. Thank you. Uh, Metapolios and strung them with threads of antelope hair, leather, sinew, and other kind of plant materials. So the fishing experiments they did with these showed a success rate of about 37%, although the failures may have been due to kind of animal-based threads, which were not as good as plant fiber and would snap or loosen when they caught a fish. So again, a really good example of why you'd want to kind of test these theories out, because ultimately we are kind of dealing with the aftermath of things and it, it can be really difficult to figure out, you know, what these things are being used for. So you kind of have to try it out in some cases. Absolutely. And I mean, like, it's going to be a lot of trial and error, because as scientific as you can be about this, of course, there's lots of caveats that you need to bear in mind. One thing like coming to mind will be the, the skill of the person that's performing the act. Because say, for example, you know, like the person that's recreating the experiment by using, say, going back to the shark teeth, using the shark teeth to sort of fill it or like remove meat from a carcass may be more or more likely less skilled than someone who would have used them, you know, with that being their livelihood. Yeah, and I think a lot of these experiments that we'll talk about do kind of consider that in the way they interpret the data that they end up with. Because, yeah, it's ultimately a not entirely perfect experiment, but, you know, it's as perfect as we can get in the circumstances. No, but it's also like it's they were like an incredibly useful discipline. So it's uh, just one of those things like that there might be biases there as there is in everything and every, <laughs> everything that pertains to archaeology. So, so long as you recognize that fact. Speaking of happy days, I feel like you should probably take the next example. Well, because I guess, uh, yeah, a happy day it was. Well, we'll wind back a bit. So another thing that for which experimental zoo archaeology is used is sort of to recreate the process of domestication and the livestock that would have been kept by past populations. So one of the case studies we have here is actually a place, more than anything, uh, called Butzer Ancient Farm, which I'm sure we've mentioned several times, especially during our earlier episode, which is, well, it's just that. It's an experimental archaeology farm, just located in Charlton in the south of England, and was created in 1972 to test archaeological theories relating to Iron Age Britain at first. It now includes Roman period work, including a Roman villa, which my dog hates, by the way, <laughs> well, because they've got the period-accurate statues and the bright yeah. colours, and she yeah. hates them, which... Uh, <laughs> I get it. Those statues were super tacky. But they also now have Saxon period stuff as well, including a Saxon hall. Uh -huh. And now, 
going all the way back to Happy Day, because uh, one of the events that Butzer Ranch and Farm organised was the one and only time that Alex and myself <laughs> met IRL. <laughs> and there isn't even a photo to prove it. Yeah, we did not take any any photos. I have a photo of myself there. No photos of us together. Just to be fair, Simona is incredibly elusive. In yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so they have a lot of uh, reconstructions of archaeological buildings. These include sort of think prehistoric. They have some earlier prehistoric structures as well now, I believe. I forget what with your mesolith. Yeah, there was one that they had a fundraiser for. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing. Um, of course, Iron Age roundhouses. They also have some grain storages. Of course, the villa construction, uh, the Saxon Hall. And they also, like try to recreate uh, prehistoric farming and like growing sort of prehistoric variety or ancient varieties of crop. Butzer Ancient Farm also keeps ancient breeds of livestock, which, while I guess modern in date, are sort of the closest to what breeds sort of in the Iron Age and Roman period would have looked like. So in the case of sheep, that includes uh, Soey, which I, th- I believe they don't keep anymore because they're too good an escape artist and they just keep... <laughs> running away everywhere, Manx Loughton and Shetland sheep. They have Old English goats and pigs, which have been sort of crossbred between wild boar and Tamworth pigs. Again, sort of like trying to reconstruct, so to speak, sort of how not necessarily exactly what livestock would have looked like in those time periods, but probably close ass. Yeah, and it's also kind of a great example of why experimental archaeology in general is quite a popular thing to do. It's a very important thing to do because it does help us potentially fill in some of the gaps in knowledge. But it's also like a great kind of outreach type of activity. I mean, uh, Butzer Farm is a really good example of that in that it is a tourist kind of st- stop as well as a great source of research and uh, kind of education as well. But it's just, it's a nice way to kind of get people really involved in archaeology. And I think it it particularly works for people who are not archaeologists themselves, because I think there's sometimes a disconnect talking about the past because it is ultimately a very long time ago. But doing things like this and reconstructive work and, you know, reenactment work is really interesting and useful for that kind of stuff. Yeah, because I think, like, especially, it's, as you said, like, much more tangible evidence, because, like, say if you're not or don't already have a predisposition towards history and archaeology, (laughs) it's something you don't necessarily, not not care about, but that's never really interested you. Actually seeing it, sort of having that, they do walk in herds (laughs) moment, you know, might (laughs) spark some more of an interest. Yeah, and to be honest, as an archaeologist, archaeology can be really boring a lot of the time. So, like, it was fun to go when we went because I was, like, midway through my PhD and was at that kind of, like, exhaustion point of doing the lit review. And it was, like, kind of rejuvenating to go and see Iron Age British kind of reconstructions and reenactments in some sense as well, because otherwise I'd been bogged down in, like, you know, hundreds of papers, and it was just really boring. Sorry, it was really boring. And also watching a massive Wicker Man being set on fire. Oh, that was great. <laughs> oh, cool. I mean, that should be, that's my kind of zoo archaeology and archaeology. It was burn stuff. That was cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> In the archaeology of setting things on fire. I um, mean, I feel like I missed my calling. I could do that really well. I don't need a PhD for that. I can do that. Yeah. I do that all the time without doing archaeology. It's fine. Well, there you go. This is the episode where Alex found her calling. I'm gonna set stuff on fire. <laughs> but scientifically. So our last case study for this segment mm. is a bit different and potentially not really <laughs> an example of experiment. I mean, it's experimental. But, I mean, yeah, so it's the Aurens project. Apologies, I didn't look up the pronunciation. That's on me. I my German is not as good as I'd like it to be. 
But yes, so this is a rewilding project in Southwest Germany using backbreeding to attempt to create a modern day equivalent of an auroch based on both genetics and phenotypes. So like not only will it be genetically similar based on DNA markers, but it will also look like an auroch. So it started in 2013 and it combines modern day breeding methods with archaeological data comparing modern DNA of the current herd uh, that's being part of the project to a DNA or ancient DNA from auroch remains from the upper Rhine Valley. So they're actually at their third generation of cattle and it's mixed from several species the sayagoisa which helps kind of give them the proper coloring that they're looking for the watusi the hungarian ste- uh, steppe cattle the marinmana and the chianina cattle chianina. With- chianina. i don't know <laughs> but marinmana chianina Thank you. Two Italian breeds. I was going to say, I do vaguely remember that two of them were Italian. So thank you for that. But uh, the Chianina helps with the horn size. So it's a bit mixing and matching to see what works best. Uh, Another kind of secondary project they're doing is to examine the impact of cattle on the biodiversity of the grazing environment that they're working with, which I believe they've currently suggest the res- current results suggest that it actually is improving with this kind of new because it's not really an old species they're creating it's more of a new species that's like an old species it's very complicated i feel like but i i, I think it's kind of an interesting adjacent to experimental archaeology i don't even know what you call that i mean it's rewilding but like it's very interesting i'm not sure either if any of your listeners know please <laughs> send us an email <laughs> What you're using, it? yeah, because you're using the past to create something for the. Oh, my brain hurts now. Oh gosh. Anyway, Shall we take a break? yeah, I'm gonna take a break, and I'm. It's not. Is it? It's like future archaeology. I don't know. No. Let's take a break. <laughs> Actually, I've I've got something for you. So. Oh, I think this is the most powerful part of archaeology: is that we investigate the past through the present for the future. And it's oh. funny how, no, 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 but it, it, it really, it, it is. And in some ways, what we are creating in the present becomes the past for the future. So we, I like to think of it like we're sending stuff into the future, you know, like we're, we're pushing it out there. Like we're, we are literally manifesting the archaeological record of the future. And I think that's neat. Whoa. <sighs> Does yeah, that apply to me putting my leftovers in the bin? Because I'm creating the future archaeological record. Yes, uh, a midden's a midden. A midden's a midden. Put that on a t-shirt, a midden's a midden. On that note. Great time. We are talking about experimental zoo archaeology, which is basically, you know, doing fun things to see if we can understand the past a bit better. And this is probably the part of experimental zooarchaeology I'm most excited about because, well, I, just, it's, I like food. I'm a chubby little bunny and I like food. There's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> it's cooking, baby. <laughs> I don't think we've asked in a while. I, I do can... eat now. I've... No, like, yes, I've grown and changed as a person. Oh. I turned 30 and I'm an adult now. And I eat dinner before I record my podcasts. So, huh. What a character arc. <laughs> Five years we've been doing this. You started to see like yeah. character development. I mean, you know, you're still the youngest here. So. Yeah, this is true. I am. I'm the baby. It's di- dinosaurs. Dinosaur show. For the youth out there who don't yeah i know i i got it i got it it's really funny how we're this just seems to be like this is the theme like archaeologists do not do dinosaurs but i feel like we're all kind of like we've got our fingers in some dinosaur pies you know what i mean i wonder if a dinosaur pie would be good anyway oh do you know what? yeah sorry let's, <laughs> let's not, not go let's down that not. road i mean i had croc- i had crocodile Ooh. once yeah. in a burger and i wonder if that's like similar 
Isn't that supposed to taste sort of like fishy chicken? Everything tastes like chicken. That's how I think frog tastes like. So, yeah, probably. No, uh, maybe. Sorry, if all this talk. Of yeah, food. well, we can actually look at cooking in two different ways when we come to kind of experimental zoo archaeology. We have again the the stuff that I'm excited about, which is eating food, but also you know reconstructing the recipes themselves. There is a plethora of ancient and otherwise old recipes that we have that is available for us to kind of reconstruct through remaining literary uh, sources and also kind of just the general modes of processing and preparation and preservation. You must be very keen to get into the first case study. Well, I was going to lead into it saying that that might be one recipe that you would not be keen on tasting because it just sounds gross but is a uh, roman garum <laughs> but the uninitiated it's a roman fish sauce made from fermenting fish with salt herbs and spices i am sorry that sounds disgusting i mean you know i'm partially norwegian and fermented fish is like kind of our bag and I have to eat a fermented fish every year for New Year's, so it's not that bad, just saying. Oh, no, we do that as well. We have a type of fermented cod, which just by the smell alone, I've always refused to try. But yeah, no, we have a type, we're stockfish, so yeah, it's a type mm, okay. of um, yeah fermented cod. Just smell alone, yeah, uh, hard pass for me. I prefer my sort of modern more well, roman is an italian fish sauce of just your olive oil lemon juice some garlic and oregano or parsley lovely goes down a treat but garum in spite of the romans having a habit of writing everything down even stuff that really please why the the exact preparation details of garum were not actually well known some texts provide a general idea of the recipe, however, so that was used by researchers at the universities of Cadiz and Sevilla, who extracted the chemical composition of archaeological garum remains, including fatty acid and mineral profiles. From that information, and um, the little we had from the written record, they worked backwards to attempt to reconstruct. Awful fishy sauce. And they were able to actually work out the percentages. So you'd have an 80% fish base, anchovies in this case, 15% of salt to 5% of spices. And they would all get layered and macerated before being filtered using linen. I don't know. I think that sounds good, to be honest. Well, we'll have to do a bonus episode where like Alex reacts live at eating garum. Simona takes Alex to the hospital live. <laughs> anyway, to kind of continue the the fish theme that I really didn't think that I was going to do in this episode, but apparently there's just, it's just all fish all the time. Uh, sadly for me, again, talking about cooking fish on Holocene herbs. So burnt fish assemblages have been found on Richardson Island, a early Holocene site in Haida Gwaii in Canada, which was derived from several herfs that were kind of recovered. And it was a really interesting kind of assemblage. There's a very diverse fish species composition with most of the bone coming from rockfish. Sebastis species. But they were smaller than would be expected. So the archaeologists did some experiments in burning rockfish bone to examine high temperature effect on reducing bone size and short-term use of single slash multiple use herfs to examine the impact on fish bone quantification. So results indicated that burning was actually not enough to account for the size difference as observed in these archaeological remains. And short-term use of these hearts results in more fragmented and differential preservation across fish species and bone elements. So it would ultimately make identification processes difficult, especially for kind of figuring out the number of individual species uh, and the minimum number of individuals. And to be honest, fish bones, annoying to work with anyway. I didn't have to do an experiment to tell you that. So because burnt, burnt fish bone, that just sounds like a headache. Unburnt fish bone is a headache enough as it is. Yes, as my master's research showed me, taphonomy and fish bones are the worst. Just, just 
No. Bad times all around. But moving to something a bit bigger Not than fishy. fish. <laughs> Not fishy, quite a lot bigger, a bit more beefy but gamey. Red deer. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, recreating processes for red deer butchery. So this was an experimental butch butchery project by uh, undertaken by French researchers as part as part of Des Tracés des Hommes, which is a, a collective project that has, for which the butchering of eighteen half carcasses of red deer, Cerpus selafus, was undertaken using Middle Paleolithic stone tools. Which, to be fair, sounds like both fun and a bad time. <laughs> Of course, they had a strict protocol in place to ensure that the butchery activities were recorded carefully, so in a scientific way for identification purposes. And then they used the results to update Binford's original quote coding system for butchery activities and provided further information on less understood activities such as tendon extraction and skinning. Because believe it or not, there are multiple ways you can skin a deer. And boy, do I wish I found this paper before I submitted my PhD. Would have saved me a lot of trouble trying to update Binford's coding system myself. Yeah, anyway, Sif, we'll move beyond that and we'll head to 17th century meat preservation. So a little bit different than a lot of what we've just been talking about. Not really the processes themselves, but kind of, you know, how do we keep the remains good for a while? So base salts, aka solar salt, now known as gray sea salt, that is a lot to talk about, um, which was basically salt that was evaporated from unfiltered salt water via the sun, hence the name solar salt, but it's base salt, but it's crazy. Anyway, so it was identified in various pre-industrial recipes specifically for beet preservation. There's also been other salt types that have been identified but base salt seemed to be the most used. So experimental zooarchaeology was done, I guess, experimental cooking maybe, uh, was done using salted beef and pork and basically they recreated historical recipes and they use different salt types. So bay salt they used, obviously, but also rock salt and sea salts. And then they tested each of these slabs of meat for microbiological and mineral data. So the results actually showed that the bacteria in bay salt produced nitrites in meats, which resulted in the better ability for meat to be cured and also produced the ideal coloration for preserved meats. So like a really red coloring, which has actually been observed since the late Roman period. So who one knew there were more than one salt? I didn't. I'm smart. Yeah. <laughs> one thing that I would love, like if they mentioned is uh, how many people tried the preserved meat and ended up in hospital. <laughs> yeah. There wasn't a, uh, like, fatalities counter because it's just one of those things we're like sort of preserving it is absolutely possible and we still do it extensively but especially with pork if you get your sort of nitrate and nitrite sort of ratios it's like slightly off or it's slightly damp like you're, you're having a bad time yeah so there's a bit of risk i guess with some of these experimental zoo archaeological projects in cooking which is why maybe we'll head to another kind of use of animals, particularly animal remains, and talk a bit about crafting and how we look at it zooarchaeologically through experiments. Yeah. So our first uh, gross case study is, uh, <laughs> I guess, the type and placements of cut marks to obtain fur. Of course, there have been several experiments that have been carried out over the years to differentiate sort of between cut marks, say, for butchery or for like portioning your carcass or filleting, getting the meat out and skinning. One such experiment was carried out by Eva Ferner using her experiences in taxidermy, which is comparable to skinning practices because it's essentially that. Two main methods of skinning was using. So you have the open, which is practicing a cut along the belly and then opening the pelt out. You can see that a lot on your various sort of cow hides and sheep skins that you can get in shops. And the case method, 
just basically cutting from one back leg to the other and then just basically peel the pelt off like a tube, which is just, yeah, so gross. The process was observed also by other sort of zooarchaeologists and both modern tools and flint tools were used, in this particular example, on stoat, Mustela herminea, and hair, Lepus europeus. Once sort of the skinning was done, the bones would be deposited in the compost, compost heap to stimulate an active midden. Now, at the time of recording, only the first stoat bones have been examined, but they showed very little in the way of cut marks, mainly on the mandible. Which in a way, that serves to illustrate that skilled skinning may leave very little cut marks on the bone, actually. So there may be a lot more sort of skinning and butchery taking place in the archaeological record that we won't necessarily like immediately see or be able to notice because the marks are simply not there. Of course, there's a lot of considerations there because tools will make a big difference as well. And you tend to see that sort of across time periods that the more recent, I guess, the assemblage you're looking at is, the more refined the skinning marks will be. So especially like in some of the medieval assemblages, you can see skinning marks, like, for example, like on cat jaws, which were extensively used for fur production in Britain. Uh, sometimes they're just like the tools that were used were so fine that if they produce any cut marks at all, you'd only really be able to see them with some hand lenses. Mm -hmm. So, yes, not all cuts on the bones leave marks. And it's also, yeah, it's also that skill issue. And it's a, this is a really interesting case of having someone who is pretty skilled in this type of process as someone who had a uh, taxidermy experience, which not every zoo archaeology has. So again, it's uh, one of those good reasons why you do this kind of experiment. But it's not always this gross. Sometimes we're just looking at bones, as we often are. And in this next case study, we're basically just talking bones. It's roe deer as fish hooks. So bone fish hooks have been found across the middle Mesolithic, uh, particularly in coastal sites in Norway and Sweden. And the assumption was always they were made from kind of cervid bone, but it wasn't entirely sure what species because most of them were not well preserved. Many of them were burnt. A lot of them were weathered and they couldn't really be ID'd using zooms, aka zooarchaeology by mass spectrometry. So the only way they could really kind of figure this out is to kind of do experimental replication. So they used metapodials from various de deer species to better understand the actual creation process. And more recent experiments have shown that roe deer. Capriolus, capriolus. Thank you. Uh, may have actually been used, but they were very fragile, which on one hand may explain why we have so little preserved fish hook bones, but also may indicate that they just weren't the, the first choice or best choice and they were used because they were easier to get potentially. Moving on to, a, a, I guess, a more <laughs> ethereal case study. <laughs> this case study is about making Stone Age glue. Now I say a bit more ethereal because of course we don't have any actual archaeological evidence of this type of glue because, well, first of all, how likely are you are uh, are you to excavate a Stone Age site? Not massively. What's the likelihood are you finding preserved glue? Even less likely. So that's why experiments have been carried out to better understand how glue may have been made during the European Sto Stone Age. Several attempts have been made, including using birch tar or pitch. Pine wood, tar and pitch, pine resin, charcoal, and hide. And um, what these experiments have concluded is that hide glue made using raw hide from cows and pigs showed that well, making glue out of a pig hide is a bit difficult because there's a bit just a bit too much fat content. But the cow hide, when boiled, cre actually created a fairly flexible and strong glue. So this would have come in very handy for tool and weapon creation. Only slight Teensy little flaw in this type of glue is that it loses effect once wet. I mean, again, you know why we need to do experimental archaeology? Because we don't have the actual evidence. So it's kind of just like, well, why not, right? <laughs> what about glue? Well, they would have used 
a resin or a, a fat of some sort to sort of like bind together sort of tools and weapons. So, yeah. So glue. I just glue. literally not, I didn't, I included this in this episode because it's just something I did not think about. And boy, it was my brain galaxy brained and made huge and big thinking about this. <laughs> yeah, because you, you see that used a lot to say, still staying within sort of the realms of experimental archaeology, you see them a lot in reconstructions of uh, flint knives and daggers. So you'll have your, so your flint blade onto like a wooden or bone handle and then sort of attached with strings and some sort of pitch or tar that keeps it in place. And it's glue. Glue. It's glue. And it's not made out of pig. Maybe they tried pig for a little while and then just decided that... Although Stone Age glued, it wouldn't have been pig pig wild boar. Yeah, true. That's true. Maybe there's, there's, there's a little bit less fat content in wild boar, so it might have worked a little better. Well, I guess as we think about glue, we'll take a break <laughs> and we'll come back for our final segment. And we're back with Archaeo Animals, episode 60. We're talking about experimental zoo archaeology and we're coming to potentially the, the grossest part of what experimental zooarchaeology can be. And it's, well, taphonomy is very important, right? And just as a refresher, we have talked about taphonomy before in episodes, but it's basically the processes that occur to remains after death or to get even kind of more com complicated with it. It's basically everything that ever happens that causes remains to kind of, well, remain in, and be in part of a archaeological assemblage. Okay, what gets them from A to B? Like, where A is the animal is still alive, happily grazing in the field, and B, you've just dug it up the ground 2,000 years later. Yeah, so it includes everything from why the environment has invited these species into this region to thrive to as far as your sampling procedure as an archaeologist. So it's very expansive, but clearly very important because it's, you know, it's how we get to archaeology. And it's also, obviously, because it's so expansive, it kind of covers a lot of the things we've already talked about in the previous session. So, you know, between hunting and killing an animal to the way we process the animal for either crafting or cooking, all that stuff is included. So this kind of section will be more about the naturally occurring and potentially messier parts of taphonomy so like the non-human processes at least yeah because it's important <laughs> well because they're all part of how your assemblages form whether it's from like scavenging by other animals or simply the bones left outside or at the in the surface of a feature to sort of weather over time yeah, it's all the stuff that we need a bit more help in understanding because they are not human influenced. You know, we can, as people who have, for the most part, eaten animal products, we can, we kind of know, you know, if an animal was eaten, we might expect a certain type of look, right? But we don't potentially know, say, how a reptile may deal with a animal or vice versa, which is how other animals would deal with reptiles. And that will be our first case study, which is reptile taphonomy in the Natufian period. So snake and lizard remains are frequently found in Pleistocene Natufian sites in the Levant, but we're not exactly sure of their role in Natufian diet. So experiments have been done to kind of see the impact of both pre-depositional and post-depositional processes on snake and lizards, including the European glass lizard, Pseudopods apodus, and the common viper, Vipera palestine. So the zooarchaeologists took vertebrae from both species to kind of create a bone modification typology to compare with archaeological bone. So again, it's kind of doing something controlled to see how things influence other things and then being able to kind of just match that to what we see in the archaeological record because obviously we don't actually see how things come to be in the archaeological record. So 
this experiment basically took bones, which were digested from the eagle owl. Boobo, boobo. Yeah, I knew you'd like that. <laughs> the boobo, boobo. Uh, and these bones were used to examine pre depositional processes of consumption and digestion, as well as post depositional uh, experiments were done, including uh, weathering, burning, sediment erosion, and trampling. So all these experiments were done, and the zoo archaeologists would look at the bones as they appeared afterwards and kind of make notes on how the bone surface was modified, uh, the various patterns that were created, and they would make them into categories and eventually make this into a typology, which is great because it makes everyone else's lives a lot easier because you can just look up the typology and compare it to the, the bones you have. So... Thank you for doing that work, especially with such relatively small bones like reptile bones. And well, the results of this project when compared with archeological bones showed that the latter had less observable evidence of digestion and more evidence of trampling and erosion and breakage. So there's actually, was actively used in this project and helped to identify patterns of consumption in domestic and non-domestic contexts. And you would be kind of surprised to see the impact of digestion on bone as something I've seen firsthand. Fun fact, it gets very compressed and eroded because of all the, the fun, acidy bits in your body. Yay. Yeah, it creates those sort of like weird concretions. It's so weird. Well. And like the compression as well is really interesting. So yeah, I don't know. Don't don't eat bone. Like don't swallow bone. Hot take. Prefer yeah. Hmm. But for our next case study is uh, what happens when a jaguar swallows bones. <laughs> There's jaguar taphonomy in the Pleistocene. We have a very Pleistocene heavy episode today. But yes, so far little work had been done on understanding taphonomic characteristics created in assemblages by jaguars. Modern captive jaguars, Panthera onca, pro were provided horse bones with characteristics being identified and documented. And then once the bones were removed from said jaguar, they were used as comparison for taphonomic marks or like uh, tooth marks on bones that were allegedly inflicted by the extinct Pleistocene European jaguar. Panthera gombasogensis. That's just unnecessary. Yeah. Panthera, <laughs> Panthera gombasogensis. Now, the results of this comparison showed that jaguars were able to collapse 24% of bone epiphyses through intense furrowing. Now, furrowing, for those who are not familiar with the term, well, it's in a way, like it's exactly that. It's just creating furrows is when the animal bites on the bone and then drags their teeth down, thus creating the furrows. Tooth marks also included pitting. So like, again, that would be largely caused by the canine. So you'd have this sort of this circular sort of pits across the bone surface and scoring, which was found on 97% of limb bones. So this study indicated that the jaguars may have been significant agents of bone modification in the past. I mean, of course, another big one in the Pleistocene would have been hyenas that absolutely yeah. chomp on bones to oblivion and are probably the cause behind a lot of very severe fragmentation of bone remains from the Pleistocene. But it also kind of makes sense why we have so many Pleistocene examples in this episode, which is it is quite far into the past at that point. So we are getting to the point where, you know, we have less and less evidence per se to kind of work with when we're trying to understand archaeological assemblages so that is where experimental archaeology and zoo archaeology comes in to again kind of fill in those gaps in a way and with uh, zoo archaeology obviously we do have the the kind of ability to find comparable modern day species and you know see what happens obviously it's not going to be 100 percent. there always will be slight differences but it's pretty, I think it's, you know, it's pretty useful. And again, taphonomy in itself is such a complex, huge thing that you do need to kind of figure out exactly. Because, you know, I mean, like, 
saying, oh, obviously Jaguars probably modified a lot of bone in the past. It seems like an obvious thing to say, but if you don't have the ability to kind of compare Jaguar gnawing and the kind of marks they make with the archaeological material, you know, can't really exactly say that. Do you know what I mean? It's a lot of kind of, I mean, I think that's archaeology, isn't it? It's kind of supporting and finding evidence for things that you could maybe safely assume sometimes, especially with your archaeology. But like, uh, some of these theories, especially especially in the case of like tooth marks, like I guess experimental work is the closest way to sort of to prove your hypothesis because species like different carnivora species could leave very similar marks on the bones. So if you've got a bone that's been sitting around for 25,000 years and it's got some pitting, I mean, like, to be fair, there are probably people that can work this out, but you know, would be able to just pull it up, look at the tooth marks, say, oh, yeah, that was a jagged, oh, that was a cape lion. You know, comparison is absolutely the best way to learn and identify these things. And yeah. there have been so many predators, and, yeah, again, carnivora species in the Pleistocene period, because you would have had your jaguars, you had the hyenas, the lions. It's looking at sort of their modern sort of counterparts, especially in the case of hyena, where it's almost essentially the same animal, you're going to get a much better idea of what sort of bite signature that species leaves on the bones. And if you're interested in a much more light version of that, you can try this yourself with your dog, if you have <laughs> one, which I absolutely never, ever have done this myself for fun. But if you get, again, a bone, please don't feel like I should stress it. Not not a cooked bone, a, a raw bone, please. And... <laughs> And you give it to your dog and you let the man fun with it for a bit. And if it's safe to do so, again, not if they have any resource guarding or anything, please, please. Yeah. Take the bone back and uh, take a look at it because you will see, you know, the pitting and the furrows and the scoring that I've just mentioned. And you'll be able to see those for yourself. It's interesting because my cat has actually been doing contemporary kind of experimental zooarchaeology where she scratches and scratches at my rented carpet and is trying to see the taphonomy that she leaves behind. And as much as I try to stop her from doing her academic, rigorous kind of research, she continues to do it at four in the morning. It's very fascinating work and she's clearly very committed to it. And I'm definitely not going to throw her out the window if she keeps doing it. And then one, one night you're going to wake up and you're going to see another cat there. But it's fine because he's peer reviewing. Well, it's fine. It's because uh, my cat hates other cats. So she headbutts my window all the time when she sees other cats outside the window. She's a very fascinating uh, and very Alex-like in some ways. Not liking other people, things like that. Mine hates other cats as well. <sighs> I'd say they would go together really well, but they would just hate each other. But in different corners of the same room, they, they would just exist. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one final case study, and I, I, I picked a special one. <laughs> I picked a really interesting and, and thought-provoking one. I really want the listeners to kind of take away with the kind of majesty and, <laughs> you know, expansiveness of the, you know, how we're thinking about the human condition, how we're thinking about human relations with the world when we do experimental archaeology and zoo archaeology. And of course, I am talking about poop. <laughs> Do you know how happy I was when I found this this case study? I was like, "By God, this will be this will be the capper on our amazing episode." We are going to talk about poop. Our opus magnum, poop. It's poop. It's glue, and then it's poop, baby. The taphonomy of livestock dung. Something I never thought about in my entire life, and boy, has I have I ruined my life now. Uh, but it's, it is important. Dung is very important, folks. We need it. So experiments were used to, you know, better understand the preser preservation of microfossils in dung, specifically opaline uh, phytoliths and calcitic dung spherulites. Again, something I have literally never thought about in my entire life. But boy, we're all learning together about poop, aren't we? And uh, so these things, uh, these microfossils, actually 
originate in the digestive tracts of animals, and they can be used to indicate herbivore presence in areas, as well as support research into ecological strategies in the past, because obviously, like I said, as much as it's fun to joke about poop, it's actually quite important and has a lot of uses outside of being poop. (laughs) So... It, something we actually didn't really talk about that much in this episode, but is actually quite useful in experimental archaeology in general, is ethnography, which is basically kind of it's an anthropological approach. Uh, although archaeoethnography is a very common kind of practice, you basically go out to places and spend time with people and kind of learn from them their experiences with certain things. So in this case, with this experiment, ethnographic fieldwork in uh, Bestanser in southern Kurdistan was combined with modern samples taken from local cattle, sheep, and goat to kind of get an idea of how dung was being used for farming strategies in the area and, you know, basically what what the poop looked like uh, and kind of what the microfossils looked like. So ethnographic fieldwork also provided information to understand external factors that could impact dung composition. Because again, taphonomy, very expansive. Never really thought about using taphonomy to understand poop, but hey, my brain is small and now my worldview is so wide and galaxy brain now that I've read this paper. Sorry, I'm I'm just thinking about how sort of like approaching sort of these uh, populations when do you just like go there like hello <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm trying to do some research can i look at your cow's poop i mean it's very important clearly no it and- is but i just wouldn't like the, 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 the reaction of the people say like oh they, they, i think they want to look at my cow's poop <laughs> like- they're probably like we, we should probably know each other first like you know pleasantries should be exchanged you know find me a meal first <laughs> But yeah, so there's loads of different things that actually impact the dung composition. So your environment in general, the animal ecology, grazing patterns, penning strategies. There's a lot at play here that, again, never really thought about. Boy, I cannot believe I've never thought about this. And also, you know, like I said, there's other ways to use dung as a fertilizer. But in this case, dung was actually burnt to simulate the use for fuel or preparing for use as a building material. And then it was analyzed as part of the experimental zooarchaeology. So results from this work indicate that increased heating and higher temperatures impacts the durability and preservation of microfossils uh, fossils through uh, de- deformation, which is further impacted by composition of dung based on plants ingested. So for all those lucky archaeologists who get to look at poop and make that their speciality, this research is actually quite useful. It's something, again, like you, I would have never thought of that myself. And yeah, I mean, it's it, it, it's fun to joke about, but honestly, it, I think it speaks to why I like archaeology, which is, it's there's so many ways to go about it. You can go about it by looking at hunting, you can go about it looking at just animal remains in general, and you can go about it looking at poop. Yeah, because like, I knew that sort of, um, like, would have been used, like, I think it was used, like, in Britain as well, like, both as, like, as building material and... Oh, yeah. Fuel. Yeah. But, yeah, the preservation of microfossils sort of within the... Yeah, that's... No, not crossed my mind. Yeah, it's like that thing where as we get more technologically advanced with the way we can research archaeology, we can actually get into this kind of nitty-gritty even more. I mean, even looking at, like, pollen, archaeology, and all that stuff, that is just... It's too much for my tiny brain to really understand. I think, yeah. all in all, what is safe to say that experimental archaeology, and zooarchaeology in particular, is in equal parts gross and fun. But I think we've established through all of these great case studies that it is also a vital part of uh, the archaeological scientific process because it has given us the ability to prove a number of hypotheses that we would not have been able to otherwise. And if you want to hear us talk about more of these hypotheses in various zooarchaeological forms, you can listen to the rest of our episodes at uh, archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash animals. You can find us on Twitter at archaeoanimals. 
And you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you like slash subscribe slash follow. I don't know what the terminology is anymore. Tell your friends about us. Tell them that you can learn about both poop and glue in the same episode. We are that good. And other than that, um, we'll see you next time, folks. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Archeo Animals. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. You can find us on Twitter at Archeo Animals. Also, the views expressed on the podcast are those of ourselves, the hosts and guests, and do not necessarily represent those of our institution, employers, and the Archaeology Podcast Network. Thanks for listening. <laughs> This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.